Good morning. And welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church here in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is James Coombs, and I am honored to be a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and, and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. And with that, we acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect to the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices and ways of thinking, to learn, to learning new ways of being in community, and to be in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is led by our interim minister, Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, with music by Carla Jamie Perez, and guest pianist Chad Edwards and Martin Matthews on sax. I'm excited about that. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. And thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Based on cur the current conditions and the end of the emergency orders, our COVID task force guidance is that each of us now makes our own decisions regarding, regarding masking and social distancing while recognizing and respecting others de the decisions of others, both individually and in our small group settings. We will continue to offer a masks required and distance section at the 930 service and the hybrid option at 1130. With our deep gratitude for their thoughtful, balanced, informed guidance, the COVID task force is going on hiatus through the remainder, what will remain available if there is a surge and also for the new minister if needed. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, in the narthex, and in our new family lounge in the living room neighborhood house uh, where the service is streamed live on a big screen. And I have a few upcoming announcements for you. There will be one service at 10 a.m. on Easter, uh, April 9th, including a new member welcome, followed by our traditional egg hunt and snacks. The pledge drive is also going very strong right now. We're so grateful that every, for everyone who has pledged. We've met nearly 60% of our pledge goals so far. Let's keep this momentum going. Oh, yes. Let's keep this momentum going. Um, by, stop by the pledge table on the patio after the service to share your thoughts on how Neighborhood Church keeps you inspired, involved, and invested, and see what others have had to say. And are you feeling a little lost with all of this talk of the pledge drive? I've actually talked to a few people who are. Uh, check out our guide for making your first pledge. It explains some of the terminology, shares past giving statistics, and what your funds support. Longtime members might also enjoy the refresher too. And there are two additional gatherings going on today. Immediately after this service, the LGBTQIA Two Spirit Plus Affinity Group will be having a welcome potluck from 12.30 to 3 p.m. in the Ross, in Ross Chapel. And this multi-generational event is intended for an, any and all folks who identify as LGBTQIA Two Plus, Two Spirit Plus, their families and allies. allies. And at 1 p.m. today, neighborhood people of color will be meeting in the living room of Neighborhood House. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email posted in the Narthex or on the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and other activities at the welcome table. And again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
I said to Martin before the first service, I didn't know you played the sax. He said, yeah, I just fool around with it a little bit. It's <laughs> great. Let's stand up and greet one another if you're willing and able. Say good morning. I'm going to say hi to Lexi real quick. I'll be right back. Excellent. I know this could go on and on and on and on. Thank you. Thank you. There is nothing that you need bring with you 
to be welcome here. No right beliefs or proof of citizenship, no eternal optimism or clarity of conviction, no boundless courage or endless expertise. You do not need to know what brought you here or how you will solve that problem you're turning over and over in your mind. Your bills do not need to get paid right now and your checkbook can be a mess. It's okay. Your children may have been up half the night. Your hearing aids may not be working and your knees may be creaking. <laughs> you do not need to be already perfect or even halfway to belong in this circle where grace meets us where we are, but does not leave us as it found us. Where love resides in each of us, yet is somehow more than all. Where life still pulses and rages and heals and transforms, creating us in this day anew once more. Come, let us worship together. I am not Zenaida Robles. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to ask you to do something. All my cohorts are in New York getting ready to perform at Carnegie Hall on Tuesday. <laughs> And I should be there. But I'm here with you. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you all to stand up and turn towards the camera. And I'd like to give them a big round of applause and let them know how much we love them, how much we miss them. Go choir, how proud we are. Our opening hymn is number 18 in our gray hymn book, What Wondrous Love. So let us stand together in body or in spirit and join in singing our opening hymn and sing it as though Zaneda was, connecting, was conducting you. Okay. and Alex and little baby Jean are going to come and give us a testimonial. Good morning. 
Hi, I'm Walt. And I'm Alex. And, and this, this is Jean. Jean. <laughs> uh, so I grew up in a Christian church, and it was a huge part of my life. A lot of my friends were there, and I was involved in a bunch of activities, and I found a lot of positive role models. So when we started talking about our family, I realized I wanted a community like that for us. The only problem was, over the years, I've changed. I discovered I'm queer and trans. Uh, I learned more about our world, and I met a lot of really cool, diverse people. I realized my beliefs and values no longer really aligned with those of the church I grew up in. Luckily for us, I remembered visiting a Unitarian Universalist church in college, and I thought maybe it should be something we should investigate. So, oh, that's pretty loud. <laughs> <laughs> As a queer Jewish atheist, I was pretty apprehensive about attending anything with church in the name. But uh, after watching a service online and attending in person, we found a warm and welcoming community that shares our values, uh, especially around environmental justice, racial equity, and queer activism. And um, after watching the teens go through the Rites of Passage program for a couple of years, it really only affirmed our belief that this is the best possible place that we could be raising our kid, Gene. Uh, so for that reason, for the second year in a row, we're, we're in. in. <laughs> While I have the mic, I'd like to implore you all to come out. In two Fridays, we're doing a UU semi-Seder takeover out here on the courtyard. It's going to be great. Lots of great food, sing-along songs, which I know you all like, uh, vegetarian <laughs> options. Hope to celebrate with you there. I'm Matt Vasco, the Director of Spiritual Exploration here at Neighborhood Church. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. I wore my ally shirt today. Thank you. Uh, we have a new affinity group starting up at Neighborhood, and it's LGBTQIA2S+. And I thought, you know, my job here is education. So, like, maybe I could talk about what all those initials stand for real quick, just to make sure everybody feels like they really understand what this group is about. And so I, I wrote down the initials so I would get all the words in. And actually, when I wrote them down, it actually goes more like LGBTQQIAA2SN+. So uh, I'll explain to you what all that means. So it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, <laughs> uh, queer, questioning, intersex, or in I've also heard the I stand for inquiring before, um, asexual, androgynous, two S is two spirits, and N would be non-binary or nothing. Some people don't claim a gender. Um, and then we include the plus to make sure we capture anything else that we forgot to list in our list. So, um, so with that, what's that? Did I say, not say trans? Oh, I'm sorry, T, T for trans, of course. That was my bad. Q for queer, right. Two spirit, two S, two spirit. Right, right. So, and then the plus, because I forgot the T, my, that's my bad, I'm sorry. I wrote it down and I still said it wrong. So, that's on me. Um, so, we have a, a luncheon after second service about 12.30 in Ross Chapel. And so it's for LGBTQIA2S plus folks, their families, and allies. Which, that's, that was the point I was going to make, Ellen. I was going to say, which as Unitarian Universalists, we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. So that means we're all allies. So... Uh, at this time, yes. 
At this time, I'd like to invite all the children and youth up for a story for all ages, please. Hmm? P for pan. That's good. P for pan. There we go. Pansexual. Thank you. So my book today... Uh, Teresa's sermon is about to really listen, deep listening. And uh, my book today is also about listening. It's called The Rabbit Listened. And it's by Corey Dorfeld. So you got to listen to my story about listening. One day... Taylor decided to build something, something new, something special, something amazing. Taylor was so proud. (gasps) But then, out of nowhere, Things came crashing down. Oh, no. The chicken was the first to notice. That's what a chicken looks like when they're noticing. (laughs) Cluck, cluck. What a shame. I'm so sorry, sorry, sorry this happened. Let's talk, talk, talk about it, cluck, cluck. But Taylor didn't feel like talking, so the chicken left. Next came the bear. How horrible. I bet you feel so angry. Let's shout about it. Grr, rawr, grr. But Taylor didn't feel like shouting. So the bear left. The elephant knew just what to do. trumpet I can fix that. We just need to remember exactly the way things were. But Taylor didn't feel like remembering. So the elephant left. One by one they came. The hyena, hee hee, let's laugh about it. The ostrich, gulp. Let's hide and pretend nothing happened. The kangaroo, tisk tisk, what a mess. Let's throw it all away. And the snake, shh, let's knock someone else's down. But Taylor didn't feel like doing anything with any. Buddy, so eventually they all left. In the quiet, Taylor didn't even notice the rabbit, but it moved closer and closer until Taylor could feel its warm body. Together, they sat in silence until Taylor said, Please stay with me. The rabbit listened. The rabbit listened as Taylor talked. The rabbit listened as Taylor shouted. The rabbit listened as Taylor remembered and laughed. The rabbit listened to Taylor's plans to hide and to throw everything away and to ruin things for someone else. 
Through it all, the rabbit never left. And when the time was right, the rabbit listened to Taylor's plan to build again. I can't wait, Taylor said. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be even bigger and bolder than before. The end. And now let's sing our children and youth out to their spiritual exploration classes. One, each person is worthwhile. Two, be kind in all you do. Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a lo local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is also available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instruction shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use the envelope available at the donation box. And this week, our gifts go to the Senior High Fund. This is the, um, the, 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 Lucas, the, the Lucas Pender Fund uh, for the Senior High, which helps with a number of activities. And here we have uh, Lexi and Juke are going to tell you a bit more about it. Hello, I'm Juke. Um, today, we ask you to please donate to the Lucas Pender Foundation. Lucas was a uh, senior high member for years, um, and sadly, he took his life. His mother started this foundation to help others by giving the youth opportunities to attend district events. It's an important and incredible foundation with the goal to help so many. Please give what you can. If you are unable to donate, we have um, another, another opportunity next week at the senior high service. Thank you. Will the volunteers please come forward? The piece that we're singing for Offertory uh, was written by Rena Ismail. Um, and Rena is uh, an incredible conductor and composer and cohort of Dr. Zaneda Robles. Um, it's wonderful to see so many women of color um, bringing their cultures to the fore as prominent conductors and composers. This is called Listen. <clears throat> listen, listen. Listen to the waves it makes. Listen to your voice as it's singing. Listen to the space it takes. Listen to your heart as it's beating. Listen as your soul awakes. Cause one act of love I know for sure is to listen, 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 listen to the voices inside you, guiding you to be more, listen 
Please join me in the spirit of prayer, of meditation, reflection. Let us ground our bodies and open our spirits. Spirit of love and life, let us attend to what you whisper in our ears. Be gentle with one another. It is a cry from the lives of people battered by thoughtless words and brutal deeds. It comes from the lips of those who speak them and the lives of those who do them. Who of us can look inside another and know what is true? What is there of hope and hurt or promise and pain? Who can know? from what far places each has come or to what far places each may hope to go. Our lives are like fragile eggs. They crack and the substance escapes. Handle with care. Handle with exceedingly tender care for there are human beings within, human beings as vulnerable as we are who feel as we feel, who hurt as we hurt. Life is too transient to be cruel with one another. It is too short for thoughtlessness, too brief for hurting. But life is long enough for caring. It is lasting enough for sharing. It is precious enough for love. Be gentle with one another. Amen. How do you say to your child in the night, nothing's all black, but then nothing's all white? How do you say it will all be all right, 
when you know that it mightn't be true what do you do careful the things you say children will listen careful the things you do children will see and learn children may not obey but children will listen children will look to you for which way to turn Careful before you say, listen to me. Children will listen. Careful the wish you make. Wishes are children. Careful the path they take. Wishes come true. Not free. children sometimes the spell may last past what you can see and turn against you careful the tale you tell that is the spell children slip away and I won't hold so tight what can you say that no matter how slight won't be misunderstood what do you leave to a child when you're dead only the things that you've put in its head things that your father and mother have said that were left to them too Careful what you say, children will listen, careful you do it too, children will see and learn, guide them but step away, children will glisten, tamper with what is true. Children will turn if just to be free. Careful before you say, listen to me. Children will listen. Children will listen. Children. Children will listen. A few months ago, I joined the faculty of an organization called the Interim Ministers Network which is a multi-denominational resource and teaching center for any kind of transitional ministry. So for the last two Mondays and Tuesdays, I co-taught a class on ministerial leadership online all day on both days, beginning at 7.30 a.m. I deserve a reward. But one piece of the curriculum was to teach listening skills. You would think that a class of 15 ministers, most of whom were quite experienced, would already have that skill down pat. And I think they mostly do, but we can always use with a brush up. We put people into small groups so that they could practice with each other. And when they came back, one participant said something 
that nearly broke my heart. He said, it was just such a pure pleasure and a gift to feel really listened to. I haven't felt like that in a very long time. And so I ask you, when have you felt truly listened to? What did it feel like for you? If you haven't had that experience in a while, what would you want it to feel like? Not just in your mind, but in your body. I'm guessing that it would feel totally relaxing. Because when we feel really listened to, we can relax all of those implicit and explicit messages that we give to ourselves about the dangers of feeling vulnerable. We let down our guard and let another into our little world. A few weeks ago, I quoted from Jeff Brown's book, Articulations. If you're in need of a set of lovely little reflections about what it means to be human, I highly commend it to you. And here's one of them. He says, I have a particularly difficult time with corrective listeners. These are the friends who listen to what you're going through and then correct it. For example, you tell them how difficult things are right now and they remind you of all the things that you've accomplished. Or you share some economic challenges and they tell you all the ways that you can make more money. Or you share your grief around a personal loss and they list off the names of those who are still in your life. Their intentions are often very positive and sincere, but what gets lost is the healing nature of simply being heard not improved upon, heard. This is the best way to improve each other's realities. Listening in. And he continues, what the world needs now is a true conversation, not a conversation between our adaptations or disguises or defenses, not a conversation that hides our truth under a bushel of shame, not a conversation about what doesn't matter, but a conversation that is revealed, revealing, deeply genuine. Perhaps that is the key to most everything, true sharing from the deep within, nothing to hide, nowhere to hide it. I thought that was worth quoting at some length and I almost feel like my sermon is done now. He said it so beautifully, but I will keep going. Because even as we say that the world really needs good listening now, I know how hard it is. The humorous friend Leibowitz once said, the opposite of talking isn't listening. The opposite of talking is waiting. Wait for it. And of course, that's what we do, right? Even with our best intentions, we engage in what Jeff Brown calls corrective listening. When we're not really fully attending to the other person, we're busy thinking about what we want to say next. It's human nature. I do it all the time. I rarely feel like I'm being the best listener that I can be. But I do know the feeling when I feel really listened to, and I sometimes have the privilege of experiencing someone opening themselves up to me, seeing in their face and glimpsing in their bodies how it feels to them to be listened to. So there's two sides of this, right? Listening and being listened to. And both of these require a certain vulnerability. Fully listening means setting aside our own ego needs to have the best story, to have the perfect response, to try to offer the best solution. These are not bad instincts, they are deeply human. But it requires a kind of vulnerability to set them aside and not make the conversation be about us, to let the other person lead 
to take the time and attention we would normally dedicate to ourselves and offer it as a gift to others. And to offer our story, to let go of what Brown calls our adaptations, our disguises, our defenses, and to tell our deepest truths is probably the most vulnerable thing that we can do. So let me back up here and talk about communication in a broader sense, because communication is not just about words. In fact, it is rarely about words. When I was in seminary taking a preaching course, we were taught that people can only really take in about a third of what you say. Quite humbling to contemplate. People can get lost with one thing that you start talking about and end up in a place that has almost nothing to do with what you're saying. And these last few years have taught us something about what real communication is not. A communication, a conversation on Zoom, no matter how compelling, cannot possibly communicate everything that you would learn from someone in person. I remember early on in my time here, I was facilitating a Zoom conversation about some very difficult experiences people had had at Neighborhood a few years ago. And afterward, I received an email from someone on that call who said, and I could tell that so-and-so was staring at me and judging me the whole time. And I had to explain, you know those boxes move around, right? It would actually be really hard to notice who is staring at you. But that's human nature. If we've had a difficult relationship with someone in the past, we'll project all of that difficulty onto any future conversation, especially if we don't have the chance to really attend to the whole person without the ability to have a real embodied conversation, which can give us more emotional cues and comfort, the things that words alone cannot provide. So let me offer an example of how emotion can impact our interpretation of words. I imagine almost all of you grew up singing the nursery song, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Let's sing it. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. My Bonnie lies over the sea. My bonnie lies over the ocean. Oh, bring back my bonnie to me. Bring back, bring back. Oh, bring back my bonnie to me, to me. Bring back, bring back. Oh, bring back my bonnie to me. Now, that feels like just a nursery ditty. We don't really even think about what the words mean. But imagine that your beloved Bonnie is across the world because she is fighting in a devastating and dangerous war. You have no idea whether Bonnie will actually survive or not. Let's hold how that feels in our minds and hearts. And let's sing it again. My bonnie lies over the ocean. My bonnie lies over the sea. My bonnie lies over the ocean. Oh, bring back my bonnie to me. The same words, different feelings, different interpretations. Context is 
everything. Gestures and facial expressions communicate more than words ever will. And the trouble is we often have different interpretations about what gestures and facial expressions mean. Crossing your arms in front of your body could communicate defensiveness, or it could just be because you're cold. I remember when I started a new job and had my first meeting with a new board, and at one point my back was bothering me, so I just stretched like this, and the board chair looked at me and said, I, I'm having such a hard time right now because you're, you're using that male-dominant gesture. <laughs> I'd never heard that was a male-dominant gesture, but it's easy for people to interpret things differently. And it's a wonder we can really communicate at all. One of the concepts that I teach often when I teach about conflict transformation is called the ladder of inference. And what it's trying to get at is the fact that we all experience the world differently from one another, even just at the level of looking at what is around us. Because there's a million pieces of information coming at us all the time. We can't possibly attend to all of them. So from the very beginning, we're choosing and interpreting what we're going to pay attention to, which is different from what someone else may pay attention to. So for example, if you look at this piece of furniture here, if you come into the sanctuary for the first time and notice that this looks like an antique, it looks quite old. So you may see that and start making a hunch that this congregation has been around for a really long time. And then you could start to make an assumption that because of that, this congregation might be more traditional than most. And then you might come to the conclusion that this may not be the right church for you. Maybe it's too conservative. Maybe it resists change. Just based on that one data point. Now, certainly we take in other things beside that, but I think you can see the point. I can tell you another story from my past. When I was in college, my then boyfriend and I decided to move in together. He came from a very conservative Catholic family and he was loath to tell his parents about it, especially his mother who took her faith very seriously. And so he didn't tell her until the day we moved in together. He finally screwed up the courage and called her and I could hear her through the phone across the room. But what about the baby? <laughs> baby? What baby? Finally, she calmed down enough and he was able to walk her down her ladder of inference and realize that this is what was going on in her head. A, we were moving in together, which probably meant we would share a bed. Two, sharing a bed meant that we might actually have sex. Three, if we had sex, he would probably not use any birth control because he was a good Catholic boy. And if he didn't use birth control, I would probably get pregnant. If I got pregnant, the baby would be born out of wedlock and suffer. So what about the baby? <laughs> we all carry babies around in our heads that are creations of our imagination without realizing that they are not reality. And sometimes those imaginings make us incomprehensible to others. To really communicate, to really get an important message across, we have to engage in deep listening, to take the time to walk people down their ladders of assumptions, to test for why someone thinks the way they do, to take the time to repeat back what we have heard and make sure that we got it right. If that sounds incredibly awkward, it's because it is. We're not taught this as children. We're not taught this in schools. We're not taught it as adults. When we're having difficult conversations with someone we disagree with, another thing that can get in the way is that sometimes we feel that simply listening to someone implies that we agree with them. And when the disagreement is painful, it can feel like we're condoning what they say. 
But when we engage in deep listening, when we can set aside our assumptions and open ourselves up to really listen, to consider the possibility that we might have something to learn, we've taken the first step toward transforming that disagreement into a new possibility for relationship. I'll be talking about this more on April 16 when I will be preaching about conflict transformation and I'll be offering a workshop that afternoon. But for now, I will say that without listening, we have no hope for finding any kind of reconnection or reconciliation. To me, this isn't just about communication. It's about a spiritual way of being in the world. It means approaching the world with what I call holy curiosity. To consider the possibility that it's not just what we know that matters, what we learn can matter even more. Again, this requires a certain kind of vulnerability, a certain kind of trust that can feel difficult to give. But what would our lives be like if we stayed within our safe little shells all the time? It would be like not truly living. The theologian James Corse wrote, whenever we allow our trusting relationships to be confused with power or control, we have abandoned genuine radical trust acting as though we are actually sufficient in ourselves for all that we may need or want, true trust has an altogether different quality to it. I can only trust those persons over whom I have absolutely no control. It is a scary proposition indeed to offer that kind of trust to open ourselves up that fully, both in listening and in speaking. But as the poet David White said, we are here essentially to risk ourselves in the world. We are a form of invitation to others and to otherness. We are meant to hazard ourselves for the right thing for the right love, for the right work, or for a gift given against all the odds. And in all this continual risking, the most profound courage may be found in the greatest risk and the greatest vulnerability and perhaps the greatest prize of all, the simple willingness to allow ourselves to be happy along the way. So may we gift ourselves with this key to happiness, opening ourselves up to others, receiving the gifts of others with a whole heart. Amen. Our closing hymn is found on page 86 of your gray hymnal. It's also... Uh, on the screen. Blessed spirit of my life, let us stand in body or spirit and join together in our closing hymn.
Please be seated. Words from my colleague, Kendall, Kendall Gibbons. There is finally only one thing required of us, that is to take life whole, the sunlight and the shadows together, to live the life that has given us with courage and humor and truth. We have such a little moment out of the vastness of time for all of our wondering and our loving. Therefore, let there be no half-heartedness. Rather, let the soul be ardent in its pain, in its yearning, in its praise. Then shall peace enfold our days and glory shall not fade from our lives. Amen. I'd like to just take a moment and thank so much Mr. Chad Edwards on piano and Martin Matthews on saxophone and Wendy Hunter and Tony LaBelle for their beautiful help with the duet today. Thank you. Just as a tree is sure, its leaves will reappear. It knows its emptiness is just a time of year. The frozen mountains dreams of April's melting streams. So clear it seems you must believe in spring. You must believe in love and trust it's on its way. Just as the sleeping rose awaits the kiss of May. So snows of things that come and go when what you think you know you can't be certain of you must believe in spring and love
must believe in love and trust it's on its way just as the sleeping rose awaits the kiss of may so in a world of snows of things that come and go where what you think You must believe in spring and love. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.